Good morning and welcome to our Talking to Children About Cancer seminar. My name is Linda and with me today are my Leukaemia Foundation colleagues, Amber and Jenny, and our special guest, Christina Stuzas. I'd just like to start with an acknowledgement to country. The Leukaemia Foundation acknowledged the traditional owners of the various lands we are coming together on. We recognise their continuing connection to the land, sea and the community. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, for they hold the stories, traditions, the culture and hope for their people. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome our guests, um, Christina Struzas. Christina is a clinical social worker in the Parent Matters Program at Peter McMallon Cancer Centre, otherwise known as Peter Mac, um, and provides support to parents with children and young people up to 25 years of age in their families. Christina has a keen interest in promoting positive parenting connections um, between parents and their children and young people as they move through their cancer diagnosis, treatment or end of life care. She works to develop parental confidence in parents' abilities to communicate with, support and foster strong connections and well-beings with their children and young people to minimise adverse outcomes within families. Christina comes to Peter Mac with a 10-year social work background which includes working with vulnerable families experiencing illness, grief, loss and mental health issues and much more through Canteen, Child First, which is now Orange Door, Lifeline and the out of home care sector. Um, go ahead, Christina. Perfect. Thank you, away. Linda. And hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you today. And whilst I wish we didn't really have a need for this kind of presentation, I'm really glad that you've actually made the time to be here or to take the time to watch this session as well if you are needing that level of support for yourself. What I'm hoping for for you throughout this time together, throughout our journey today, is that you walk away from this session feeling like you've got the information that you need, but also feeling like you've got some resources at hand that are going to help you through this journey that we call parenting through cancer. So what does this journey look like for us today? Well, today I'm going to talk to you about why it's important to talk about cancer. What are some of the common parental concerns that I do hear and some tips for you to keep in your mind? I'm going to talk to you about what children and young people actually understand about cancer and what they need from their parents or caregivers. I'm also going to talk to you about how you can actually talk to your children and young people and support them throughout your journey and when it's appropriate for you to seek help. But I, before we go on this journey together, I want you to cast your minds back to that moment when you started your parental journey. And I want you to kind of recognize that with any kind of journey, you are in a constant state of stepping into the unknown. So whilst you might have had all the love and all the wishes um, as to how life will be with your little ones in your hands, there's probably a level of uncertainty around how things are going to unfold in your parenting. And there's often twists and turns that can come into play when we actually go through our journal of parenting. And the same can happen throughout our cancer experience. I kind of equate this as to stepping into the wilderness. So if you imagine yourself, you're probably traveling along life, your best friend life is with you and things are going pleasantly okay. But all of a sudden life takes a bit of a twist for the unexpected and life drops you out into the wilderness and you're at the front door of this big dark forest, which can look quite dark and daunting at times. And as you're standing there for the first time, it can bring up a variety of different emotions, different thoughts. And sometimes as you're kind of noticing how the light and the darkness are playing through the trees, you find your mind starting to wander in different ways, down pathways that you never imagined you would be in. And perhaps maybe this wilderness is actually familiar terrain to you somehow. Perhaps you've been through this terrain before. But for some reason, this terrain looks vastly different. Perhaps the weather conditions have changed for you or perhaps even the grounding doesn't feel quite as secure as it once did. Or perhaps you might be the type of person who's actually made yourself go through this terrain before and you're out the other side and you're trying to adapt to life as normal again. 
But for some reason, your mind keeps wandering back to that time into the wilderness and things for you seem vastly different. There's been an impact through your journey through that wilderness that you carry with you today. So as you're standing there at the wilderness, it can sometimes feel like you're quite alone and you're not quite sure which way to turn or what's available to you. But when you actually start to equip yourself with the right level of resources and tools, that wilderness, that terrain, even if you're out the other side and you're trying to adjust to life as normal, can look different to you once again. I want you to imagine, for instance, you've got yourself all of a sudden a compass or a map. That compass gives you the exact information that you need to kind of get your bearings as to where you are right now. And the map gives you the possibilities for which way you might navigate that terrain. And for you, that might be having the accurate information that you get from your medical treating team or your support team, whether that's in the community. I also want you to imagine that all of a sudden, you might actually have the ultimate tool guide at your hands. That might be your medical team. These are the people who know the ins and outs of cancer, know the ins and outs of what's going on in your system, know the ins and outs of that terrain and can give you options as to how you might navigate through that terrain or beyond. And perhaps even you might even have some tool companions with you, people that are familiar to you in your life or people out in the community or in other areas of support where you can start to draw upon their collective strengths. They might have their own knowledge and wisdom or perhaps they've even packed some supplies for you that are going to help you to travel through that terrain with much more ease. So I want you to imagine yourself as you kind of at this door of the wilderness now looking at this forest. Perhaps it's starting to look a bit more manageable for you. You've got some things that you can draw upon and I'm hoping today we can touch on a few of these things so you feel like you have these tools and these resources with you as you embark on this journey. But I want you to also keep in mind that you're not alone in this journey. You've got your children with you suddenly, standing at the wilderness with you. And I'm wondering for you, as you were standing at that wilderness for the very first time, or maybe returning to that wilderness, that can sometimes feel like a very alone and scary space. And for your children, I'm wondering whether you would want to equip them with the same kind of resources that might be available to you. Because when they have that compass, when they have that ultimate tour guide, and when they also have that travel companion or team that are there to support them, that wilderness can also look vastly different to them. And perhaps those trees don't look so tall and scary after all. And I imagine that they will actually be looking towards you as their caregiver, as their parent or guardian, whatever that structure in your family might be, to be all three of those things at different times. So I just want you to hold that in mind as we go through this talk today. So let's start on this journey together and see how we go. So why talk about cancer? Well, research repeatedly shows us the benefits of children and young people being informed. When children and young people have the opportunity to discuss their feelings about what's going on and to ask questions and receive information that helps them to get their bearings. So think back to that, having that compass, having that map and having the opportunity to actually perhaps talk to that ultimate tour guide who can guide them through. They have the opportunity to actually cope with greater ease. What we tend to see in practice and what we also know from our research evidence is that when children and young people have open, accurate information about what they're dealing with and the opportunity to express their feelings and to know where they can access support, that this builds a strong bond and a healthy relationship between parents and their children and young people. And children and young people are highly intuitive. They're sensitive to the stress that you are under and also in their environments. And they often have a sense that something is going on. And often sometimes what can happen is there might be misinformation or assumptions that are incorrect when they don't have that right information that they need. So I'm a very strong believer um, and supporter of parents and guardians and caregivers where they can 
to be able to provide them with the information that they need in a way that makes sense to them, but to also be that ultimate tour guide and even that travel companion as we go through this journey. Now, I'd like to be able to tell you that this is going to be an easy thing, but it isn't. Yeah, so parents, parenting journey in general is a very stressful one. You know, we're constantly second guessing ourselves. We're constantly coming from a place where we're wondering what's best for our children and our young people. And when cancer comes crashing into your lives, this can sometimes be exacerbated. And what I notice when I speak to parents is that a lot of the times the worries and the concerns that parents have are actually coming from a place of love and a place of wanting to protect their children and young people. We are naturally wired to do that from the get-go. So I often hear things like, my children are too young, they don't know what's going on. Um, sometimes I hear things, particularly if you've got young people in your families, they're in their old mode, they're too busy gaming, they don't know what's going on, they're clueless, they haven't even noticed what's going on. Sometimes parents worry about how much do I actually share with them because I don't want to stress them. I don't want to worry them. There's too much going on in life in general already. And sometimes parents might worry about disruption to what's going on in life already, whether that's studies or there's big transitions that are going on in families already. And sometimes parents are really nervous around what if I say the wrong thing? What if I get this wrong? What if I can't actually answer what they're asking me? I want you to know if there's one key thing that you take away from this talk today or from listening to this in your own time, it is this. You are not going to harm your children or young people by being open and honest with them and allowing them that space to ask what they need and to receive information in the way that they need. These conversations aren't comfortable, but often what I hear from parents is a sense of relief actually when they're starting to have these conversations with their children and young people, because it's almost like leaving your child alone in that wilderness, looking at that big dark place, trying to guess what's going on, because they know something's, something's up, they're highly intuitive and they know something's up and they don't know which way to turn versus them actually standing in the wilderness with you and you've got your compass and your map, you've got your tour guide there and you've actually got your support team there. I also just want to take a moment to acknowledge our diversity of families that we often see and that we have in Australia as well. And whilst this slide doesn't actually capture all of the diversity of families, I just want you to understand also that you have a diversity of wisdom and knowledge already. Um, you have a diversity of the way that you have special interactions with your children and young people. And I want you to remember that. Um, conversations about cancer are ongoing they're not one-off conversations and what's really important is not just what you say but how you are with your children and young people you've gone through a vast amount of change already in life and you can draw upon those um, experiences about what works well in your families whether you have a small family whether you're a single family maybe you have a mob that you can draw upon maybe you have um, you know, diverse friends that you consider part of your family and part of your support unit. Just have a think about what's really working for you and draw upon your natural resources and the wisdom that you already have at hand. And I also want you to hold this in mind as we go through talking about different developmental stages and what uh, children and young people need. The single most common factor to building resilience in your children and young people is to have one stable and committed relationship and support, whether that's with their direct parent or caregiver or another adult. And that adult might even be through the school system, um, through other avenues, if that can't be you. It just takes one significant person to make things okay and to help your child to look at that wilderness and work through that terrain in a very different way. All right. So now we're going to go through some of the different ages and stages and what 
each of our children and young people actually know when it comes to cancer and what they need from their parents and caregivers. Um, so here we'll start at the very beginning um, from infancy up to what I call the twilight twos. And here things are very limited in terms of their kind of language capacity. They're still in a very symbolic way making sense of, oh, this is a block, this is what's happening this is mum or this is dad or this is grandma or whoever it is in their world. And what they ultimately need is a sense of safety that comes through their routines. So am I being fed? Where's my physical contact coming from in that comfort? When it comes to cancer, you can talk to them still about the word cancer, but their understanding of that isn't really going to be something that they grasp. So you may find that um, they may have a sense of maybe being sick. Uh, maybe they've had a cold before and you can talk about things in terms of sickness to them. But remember, things are very kind of abstract and, and, and very kind of symbolic for them. And they don't really have the capacity for remembering things or for really making sense in the way that you and I as adults would be making sense of things. Having said that, your children at this age are very sensitive to what's going on. They have a very strong felt sense about what's happening. So they're gonna notice the stress that's within you. They're going to notice the changes within their environment and any stresses that might be going on. And if there are significant periods of separation, for instance, if you're having to have a hospital stay or anything like that, this can be a very unsettling time um, for our early childhood years. So you might see things like them becoming unsettled in their behaviours. They might be increasingly clingy. Um, they might be out of sorts with their sleep routines. Think about anything that you would start to be worried about with regards to your children at this age that you would probably be going to your maternal child health nurse about. It's very similar when cancer comes into your worlds. So sometimes we might see, particularly in the toddler years, um, what we call a regressive regression in behaviour, and that's when they start to act a little bit younger. They might start sucking their thumb a little bit more or engaging in baby talk if they're unsettled. Um, they might seek more emotional comfort and want more uh, tactile kind of comfort, that closeness and hugging kind of support. And I'd encourage you as much as possible where it's comfortable to be able to help them to anticipate what those changes are going to be throughout perhaps their play. You can even role play, you know, mom or dad or whoever it is that's the caregiver is going into hospital. Let's have a look at how we might play kind of doctors and things like that for them to get a bit of a sense of things. And I'm talking more around that kind of toddler age, um, but there's nothing wrong with you actually talking through what's going to happen and to bring in the caregivers that are going to help you to ride through those changes. So because they want that stability in their routines and we want to keep that as normal as we can, enlist your supports within your travelling companions, within your community as early as you can and particularly think through what are the big changes that they're going to notice. Is it that someone's dropping them off to childcare that's usually not doing that? Do I need to enrol them into childcare for a little bit longer? How do I help them prepare for that? What about if I lose my hair? That's a very drastic change for them to get familiar with. So you might want to use storybooks or other things, playing with dolls to get them used to those kind of changes and to make those changes where possible, as gradual as possible so that they can start to adapt um, to those changes and you can read their cues around coping. You also want to look at natural ways for them to... Um, Relax. So for babies who are highly sensitive, you might increase things like baby massage. Um, where if you've got an older toddler, you might use stories or things that they naturally enjoy engaging in. You want to keep those things up because this is their natural way of letting off steam when there's big changes. In terms of what you might say, you might say things like, mum or dad's very sick. I need to go into a place called a hospital and that's where there's lots of doctors and people that are looking after my body so I can try and get better. Um, 
that means that grandma is going to come and look after you or whoever it is going to come and look after you a little bit more. And I'm going to be around at these times and we can still have our play time. So you want to talk in those kind of ways. And there's nothing wrong with even talking to your baby in that kind of way as well. They take in more than we know. Beautiful preschool ages. So this is a time where they're starting to really hone in on the language and try to make sense of words and what's going on, but they're still struggling to understand illness. They may have had a little bit of experience with regards to illnesses themselves. Maybe they've had to go to the doctor, so they might have a bit more of a sense of what goes on. Um, but this is a time where you can anticipate repetition. So lots of questions on repeat and those questions are going to go out to multiple people, not just to you as their parents, but it's going to go out to everybody. So you need to kind of have your traveling companions, your support team equipped for those kind of questions as well. Here we still got very kind of concrete thinking. By concrete, it's almost like A equals B. Mum was here today, she's not here tomorrow. It's making sense in a very literal way rather than mum's going to go away for a while. You want to keep it very simple um, in your language when you're talking to them and avoid any kind of vague information or things that might not make sense to them. So here you can use the word cancer. You can actually tell them, I have a sickness called cancer. And that means that parts of my body aren't working how they need to. And I will need to go and get myself some treatment from some amazing doctors who are going to give me some special medicines to help my body work at its best. Yeah. I tend to want parents at this stage to really follow your children's cues. So keep things simple and know that you're going to be on repeat. Um, what they really need is reassurance and know that the type of thinking that they have is very me focused here. So whenever you're actually having conversations about cancer, you also need to have this in the back of your mind. Answer these questions. Who's going to be looking after them? Um, what's going to happen to them? So if you're going to be talking around I need to go into hospital. You need to answer the question of who's going to be looking after them and help them to anticipate that change. And where possible, please make it as visual as possible. Remember, they're not used to language in the way that we are. Their world is very visual still, and they like to engage in things in a very visual way, even if that's through the storybooks that you might use or through their play. Try and make it in a way that makes sense to them. I also want to give you a word of caution that this is a typical kind of stage, usually at around age four, where we start to get a bit of magical thinking. And by that, I mean, they can think that they might have created something or caused something. So it's really important from kind of these stages, even onwards, um, that you reassure them that there's nothing that they have said or thought or done that has created this situation that you're experiencing right now. And that includes if you find yourself a little bit more fatigued at home, you've just come back, maybe you've had some chemotherapy, um, you're feeling a bit more fatigued and out of sorts and you can't play with them. In their world, they're wondering, you know, why, why, why can't we do this? Yeah, why, why is this happening? Maybe I did so. Maybe it's because I didn't put my blocks away before. Um, so it's really important that you even let them know things like, you know, I'm just feeling a little bit more tired because the medicines made me a little bit more tired, and I love spending time with you. Um, and I'm really looking forward to when I'm feeling a little bit better that we can have that special time together. Um, keep it simple, reassure them, use your tools in terms of play and storybooks or anything else that they love to do and, you know, assure them that they haven't caused anything, um, including any emotions that you might be having as well. Um, and where possible, try and help them to anticipate those changes in a very visual way, both in their physical environment, their emotional world, and in their um, more social environment too. The way you foster stability is to keep their routines as stable as possible here. So if they're going to childcare, keep that up. 
Um, if they've got days that they're spending with caregivers, keep that up. You might want to enlist your supports early again, but try and keep that routine as stable as you can. And I know that that's not always the case, and that's where it's really important that you reach out for help if you need it. All right, the beautiful school ages. This is where the capacity for understanding cancer starts to increase. And we've got that sense of, you know, more curiosity about things, more problem solving that kind of comes into play. But be mindful that at these ages, between the ages of kind of six to 11, they're still very um, literal in their thinking. Things are, you know, they can't really grasp that abstract concept. So if we can keep things visual in our explanations, again, there's some great resources that we'll talk to you about later on uh, on how to do that. That can be really, really helpful. Um, this is also an age and stage where we tend to see just an increase in fears that start to emerge. And it's because of the way their brains are developing. So usually around the age of seven and eight, this is a time that you don't want them watching the news. Yeah, you don't want them exposed to things that can feel very overwhelming. So imagine your child standing at that wilderness and the daunting feeling of these trees look enormous right now. How are we going to shrink that size of the trees down for them? We do that in a way um, that we be consistent where we can um, and we give them the information that they need. It's really important at this stage that we give them the information that they need because if you think to that beautiful problem solving kind of mind or that wandering mind, sometimes if we're not giving the, them the information that they need, they can make incorrect assumptions about what's going on. So it's really important that you even check what they understand based on what you've said. And you are still going to be on repeat at this stage too. Don't assume that one conversation is enough. But again, follow your children's cues. Don't feel like you have to bring up conversations all the time with them. Um, follow when they're wanting to engage in those kind of conversations and when they're asking those questions. And a word of warning, expect the most random questions to come through as well uh, because of that beautiful curiosity that they might have. Something that you're not expecting might come through and I'll kind of give you the example of... Um, yeah, a parent that I was working with and they'd, they'd um, spoken about their diagnosis or early in their diagnosis, they spoke about their diagnosis and their child was like, okay, all right. But who's going to put the, the polish on the car on the weekends? Yeah, so they're, in their world, things are still very much about what's going to happen to them, what you can do together. Um, sometimes it might not be quite specific about what's going on with you, but that information is coming into them. Here you can use uh, cancer language. You can talk to them about, I have this sickness called cancer. Um, and what that means is that I've got cells that aren't working as well as I need them to. Um, and I have to go into hospital or I have to meet with the medical treating team um, so that they can give me special medicine to get my system working at its optimal state. Um, it's important that you ask them what they understand so you can clarify. Do they know what a cell is? If they want more detail, how are you going to explain that? And try and keep it in a way that's picture form. And there's an excellent app um, that uh, will be recommended later on through Camp Quality called the Kids Guide to Cancer app that allows you to uh, uh, sit down with them in a way that they can see things quite visually in an interactive way as well. Once again, you really need to assure them that regardless of the changes that you're experiencing, there's nothing that they have done, thought, said, or created for this situation to occur. And the stability for them will come in knowing what their routines are and how they can be with you. So when are the good times um, kind of coming and you would explain to them that, you know, I might feel out of sorts at times. And that means that when I'm in that state, I'm not going to be able to take you to football or I'm not going to be able to take you to your dancing classes. This is who's going to step in to help out at that time. But I'm really hoping that we can have good times together. So on the days that I'm feeling well, what are some things that we can do together that's special to you and I to make sure that we get the most out of our time together? 
And I want you to also think about what's important in your families. What are the values that you hold true that are really important? And those values might be something like having really open, honest conversations, making sure that you don't go through things alone. And as you hone in on those values that are important to you as a family, you want to share those values with your your extended supports, so your travel companions or anyone who might be interacting with your children so that you're on the same page with your messaging um, and so they don't feel alone in their experience too. Um, but you know that your communication is consistent because children will go and ask things of different people and that's not because they don't think what you told them is right, they're just trying to make sense of things in their own world. This is a time where you might also want to engage your school supports, let them know what's going on because they're there so often. Um, they can see any kind of behavioural changes that might be coming through that, um, you know, the school teachers or the principals can keep you informed about. Um, but again, you might want to have that discussion with your children around. I think it's really important that we talk to the school about what's going on. I've got, you know, I've got this big window. Maybe you've got surgery or something that's upcoming uh, where I'm not going to be around so much. But we know that there's key extra people that might be around to help, including at school. And I think it's important we let some people know at school about what's coming up. Um, would you like your teachers to actually come in and check in on you or does it feel a bit strange? Um, would you just want the principal to know about that? So engage them in some of the decision making um, about what you're choosing, but know that, you know, ultimately you are responsible for your children. So if you think it's going to help you to have that communication with the school, go ahead and do that. Um, you also want to be their ultimate tour guide in terms of helping your children know how to cope with the feelings that arise. So I want you to come back to you're in the wilderness for the first time or maybe the ground and the weather conditions have changed and how unsettling that can feel for you, yeah? And it comes with a mixed bag of emotions and we call those emotions a natural part of our grief experience because when cancer does come crashing into your lives, um, and you're having to navigate multiple changes, it comes with a sense of loss or anticipation of loss. And that can come with all the beautiful colours of emotions. But for children, they need some extra support around how to actually understand what those feelings are. They need to know that it's very normal to have these feelings that are coming up, whether that's anger whether they're feeling sad, whether they're feeling a little bit worried, but they also need to know what they can do in those moments so that we're starting to make those really big trees look really, really small to them. And so think about what are the natural ways that they let off steam? What are the natural kind of resources that they go to? There are some excellent things that you can start to practice with your children and even for yourself. There's an amazing app um, that I highly recommend to all parents, um, even parents that aren't going through a cancer journey called the Smiling Mind app. They have some amazing little resources that you can start using that help you to calm your nervous system down using some beautiful mindfulness practices and they have it in cartoon base and it's for all ages from zero now all the way up to adult life and they've got some beautiful little cartoons and things so it's something that I encourage you to practice regularly you might only do it you know a minute a day but it's starting to teach your children how they can manage their natural stress response that will come um, and what they can do. And also just reiterating to them who they can go to for support when they need it, whether that's you, whether that's one of the other trusted adults in your life. And as we embark into the world of adolescence, this is a nice little a uh, comic strip that I often share with my parents because we feel, again, that we're stepping into the wilderness when it comes adolescent time. I think it's the most beautiful time. Um, I have a, a soft spot for working with adolescents um, based on my time in canteen. But here we've got, you know, a, a mum that's coming to the library and saying desperately, I can't find any books on raising teenagers. I've looked in the medical lifestyle and self-help section. Please help me. And the librarian just calmly says to her, 
try the horror section. Um, and sometimes it can feel that way and it's because we've lost our footing and it can feel that way sometimes because as we embark into the world of adolescence, particularly the middle adolescent spectrum, um, parents often tell me they feel a sense of they've lost connection with their young person or they don't really know how to read what's going on with them. And this is a natural occurrence because in the early adolescent phase, they're still in that kind of trying to make sense of who am I? Is this normal? Is this comparing themselves to other people? But in the middle adolescent spectrum, this is a time where their peer worlds become really, really significant. And often they're less likely to want to talk to mum and dad or their caregivers about what's going on because what do you know? My friends know a lot more than you do. I'm going to go to my mates and check out what's going on. But um, I need to tell you that whilst they're at this stage of forming their independence and identity, they still need your support and they still need that accurate information and they still need your support in kind of managing some of their feelings and the different things that are going on. So your role as a parent doesn't change. You still need to be that stable ground for them by giving them the information in a way that they need, uh, by talking openly and by being that ultimate tour guide and that travel companion with them. So they feel that sense of safety. Um, really important at this stage that you are considering their peers and what life with cancer might be like as they're navigating peer worlds because that is a significant thing for them um, and also the online world has become more significant for them they're on their computers a lot more they're on their devices a lot more so you really need to be checking out you know are you looking things up online and becoming that ultimate tour guide around where they can actually go to to find that accurate information. Um, a word on the online space that I just want you to be aware of. I am I don't come from the perspective of telling young people don't go online. Yeah, you're going to tell a young person that they're going to go online for sure. Yeah, <laughs> but I come from a perspective of you know showing curiosity around you know having jumped online before and had a look around about what my cancer is about um, and what did you find and did it freak you out and what were you actually looking for when you wanted to go on there yeah and then having an open conversation around you know it's really normal to want to go online and have a look around and get a sense of what's going on but inviting them to actually come to you to have that conversation or to a trusted adult so that they can get the accurate information that they're looking for. Because in the online space, there's very general information and it can be super overwhelming. So I tend to say, let them go online and you tell them, all right, go online, check it all out. When you freak yourself out, come and see me and let's have a great conversation about what you were looking for and try and unpack this together. Uh, and usually, um, once you go down that pathway, they're probably less likely to go online because they realise that it's probably not worth their time. Um, I also just want to make a note that there is so much change going on from a neuro and biological um, perspective in young people. Their brains are wired um, on a much more emotional level um, and they're still in that uh, way of trying to develop their, their frontal lobe capacity for that planning and decision making. So please don't make the assumption that one-off conversations are enough with your young people. Um, there's a lot going on for them internally and externally that they're trying to navigate. You still need to kind of have repeat conversations. And again, the same principles apply in regards to check what they do understand and ask them about how they actually want to receive the information and kind of when. Um, I really want you to kind of think about your capacity to have taken in information in those kind of early stages or when you've had some uh, tricky news come through, perhaps you've, you know, been informed that you've had disease progression. Um, and at those times, how overwhelming it is in your system because a young person's brain is so much more emotionally wired than ours, they're feeling things more intensely. So their capacity to take in big chunks of information is limited. So you want to keep it still simple um, to the point, uh, answer any questions that are coming up for them. 
but check in with them at a later stage around what they understood as, as the conversation kind of emerged and if there's anything else that's going on for them because nine times out of ten you're probably going to find that they weren't able to take in a lot and that's okay. Um, I also want to let you know that this is a period of time with the amount of change in pressures that they're under with school and navigating uh, their sense of belonging in the world. They're naturally more prone when cancer comes crashing into their lives to be at risk of developing more stress um, and some mental health challenges like anxiety and depression. That tends to come from when they don't have accurate information about what's going on. So as that parent, as that caregiver, you really want to be that ultimate tool guide right now. You want to check in on what they understand and what they need. You want to use accurate language and information um, I would avoid at all stages, including with children and with young people, saying things like, I've, I've had a lump form or um, something that's a little bit more conceptual. You want to be quite accurate with your language. I have this type of cancer. I have a blood cancer. Um, I have lymphoma, whatever it is that's happening for you. It's a type of cancer and this is how it affects my body. This is what the doctors have told me about where I'm at in my treatment and how things are going. Um, and this is what they've told me to kind of expect. Do you have any questions? Um, and check in with them. This is often a time where parents actually say to me, I don't know whether they're taking it in. They didn't say anything or they, there's just not anything that they're giving me right now. And I want to let you know they are taking it all in. Um, the repetition is still important, but they are taking it in. Um, they're just trying to make sense, just like you. What does this mean for me right now? So again, you want to answer those questions. How is life going to be different for them? Whether you're entering the wilderness or maybe you're on the other end and you've actually come through that wilderness, how's life as normal life going to look like now? Because you know, you might still not be feeling 100% yourself and your young person might be having expectations. Yeah, we can go and go to that um, adventure park that we used to go to all the time or we can go and, um, you know, go to jump or wherever it is, but you're not quite feeling up to it. So you really need to help them around what they can do and can't do and what you can come up with together. So I'm a very strong advocate at these stages that you empower your young people and involve them, um, allow them to make decisions that are going to impact them. So if it's around, do I tell the school about what's going on? I really think you should be having those conversations openly with your young people because if you think about young people's worlds, sometimes they might be in that early adolescent phase where they're trying to find their tribe and they're like, I don't want people asking me questions. Um, I don't want teachers coming to me and asking me questions. So have that conversation with them about, you know, I think it's important maybe to let the school know, but how would we make that work? Or do you want to have that conversation with them? Do you want me to have that conversation with them? Um, you can also invite them into your medical conversations. Some young people really want more information. Um, some young people, you know, they want the ins and outs of how things work and they want that opportunity to come and sit with you at your chemo session and see how things work. That can also happen at the earlier stages in childhood. So it can be useful you know, if they're asking for that or they're, you know, asking how does this work? I don't understand perhaps if you're comfortable to bring them into the environment so they can see what's going on. Young people and children are highly visual. So the more that you can help them to see what's happening and that you're in safe hands, the more they're going to relax. But you again, want to keep things quite simple for them. So if they are coming into a hospital environment for the first time, whether it's your child, whether it's your young person, you want to help them to anticipate that change. What does the environment look like? What does your hospital environment look like? You can even look up what your doctors look like online together so they can see, oh, that doesn't look like a scary person. They look like someone who's going to be quite helpful. Maybe they can see a short little video of your doctor talking or something like that that helps them to understand that, okay, there are real people around that are supporting you. And I always come back to this, you know, 
just be curious with your young people and try as much as you can to engage in the things that you know works in the ways that you would promote their significance naturally. So what are the things that you're naturally doing as a family that works and keep doing those things? Check their online world, check their peer world and just keep that door around communication really open so they can come to you at any time. And the same with your children. Keep that conversation open and let them know, I'd rather you come and talk to me if you can or talk to another trusted adult rather than go through this on your own. And as we come through our adolescent period into emerging adulthood, we're faced with different challenges in parenting. So this is often a phase where our young people are actually still going through a vast amount of change. They're often ceasing their school um, experience and heading into the workplace or heading into university. So again, they're stepping into their own wilderness in a different way and they're trying to find their bearings. Um, their peer relationships are still really important. Um, they're still going through rapid mirror and biological changes. So things can feel like they've lost their kind of grounding. So they still need you in a lot of ways. And they're still often dependent on you, particularly financially, while they're trying to establish themselves. And this is a time where sometimes we can see they might be moving in and out of the home. And that can feel a little bit you know, unstable at times. And how you navigate those relationships is really, really key. Um, they are still at risk of maybe encountering elevated stresses because of the amount of change that they're going through. So anxiety and depression can still occur for them. And it's important if they're struggling at any point to help them still to seek the help that they need. They might also, though, be in a position where they can take on more responsibilities as well. And it's important that you talk to them about how involved they want to be in your cancer journey. Sometimes young people want to come and take their parents along to their treatments. They want to be there the whole time. For other young people, it's very different. So again, open, honest communications. Talk to them about how are things going for you? Um, what's working well, what do we need to do differently, how can I support you better and get them involved as much as they want to be um, throughout your cancer experience. It's really important though through all of those stages that you remind them to still engage in the activities that give them pleasure and joy as a young person. What are the natural ways that they can let off steam uh, because this is going to help them to ride through those storms. And again, be curious in their world, you know, cancer is not life. Cancer is an experience that you were going through and life and how you are navigating through life is the most important thing. So your conversations, you know, be curious about what's going on in their world, in their friendship world, in their work challenges, how they're going with university and other things, because this is where you can engage with them. And then you can start asking them about, okay, and, and what's it like going through all this and through this cancer experience too? Help your young people to engage in kind of healthy habits where possible. Um, and also healthy help seeking. Young people, even at this age, still need some support around help seeking, particularly if they've never had to go and seek support before. Um, that can feel like a bit of a daunting task. So if you're seeing them out of sorts at all, be curious, ask them what's going on and help them to navigate what's going on as well. Um, and, you know, at this stage, they can really hone in on the specifics of the language about your condition um, and what you're dealing with. So you might want to get even more um, specific around your blood condition um, and the ins and outs of things. Just to ask them what's actually going to be helpful for them in terms of the language that is suitable for them. Interestingly enough, um, sometimes I have found that conversations that parents do have with their young people, um, hearing the word cancer can be a little bit daunting. Um, and sometimes when you switch the language to the specifics of your condition, um, it is one that can take the edge off just slightly. I've had instances where parents are like, 
once we started talking about things in terms of what was happening in my body, for example, about my lymphoma, it didn't feel quite as daunting as the word cancer. And the reason for that is sometimes young people, they're getting exposed to things in a very different kind of way. So you need to check their assumptions around, have they watched any movies about cancer and are they making any assumptions that might be incorrect? Are they hearing things from their peers or other people? Or maybe you've had a lived experiences around this. So sometimes even using some of the more specific language can help to ease um, them into what's going on. But again, have that conversation with them. What's that like to hear the word cancer? Is that comfortable for you or not so comfortable? Is there another word that we can use to have these conversations and see what they come to you with. I imagine the same thing would apply for us as individuals. So find that language that's most comfortable for you and your family so that you can continue to have your open conversations in a way that's natural and will allow you to be at more ease. But don't go into avoiding the language, yeah? So it's really important that you're giving still the accurate information um, that they need. Now, I want you to remember at all times that... We are in a state where our parenting, we start to question things in our own kind of unique way. But I want you to remind yourselves that you have a very unique relationship with your children and young people. Um, and I want you to think about what naturally works in your relationship with your children and young people at all times. What are you doing naturally that works? When are you finding yourself at ease and where communication is flowing best. What are the things that are important to you that you can draw upon? And if you're not feeling up to having conversations yourself, who are the people that you can enlist for support to help you along the way? So if you feel like you can't get your words out at different times, who can you bring in um, to support you along the way? The main things that I want you to really remember is an open and honest approach is key. Um, pick times that's natural where you feel like you've got that good connection. It might be the driving times with your young people. That tends to be a common one. Um, and just know that it's okay to actually talk about how you're going to show your emotions. Just be you. Remember your children and young people are highly intuitive. They know when you're out of sorts and you want to minimize the guessing and just be you because you're then actually role modeling appropriate responses for them. It's easier to often start with questions to check in their understanding and then go from there and always listen behind what's actually being asked of them. Um, so just be curious in their world. Um, come to, you know, what are the changes we need to navigate and how can I optimally support my children and young people through this? Thinking about the information, the compass and the maps being that ultimate tool guide for them and also being that companion of support. Just a quick one that I'm going to finish off on, when to actually seek help. Um, I want you to, and even consider some of this, when not everything goes you if, know that you can start all over again. Take a breath and we'll start all over again. But some key times that you want to actually seek help is, come back to this, you know your children and young people really well you know when they're actually out of sorts. If you're starting to see any behavioural changes of concern, like any disturbances in sleep patterns, uh, all of a sudden you're seeing those earlier behaviours kind of come through, that you're thinking something's not quite right. Maybe their grades are dropping off at school. Maybe they're more tantrum -y if they're, they're very little. They're the times that you want to seek support and think about your supports both in the hospital system and in your community supports that you can lean on and build that travel companion group with you. So who are the trusted people in your life that you feel safe to travel with? They might be five key adults in their life that they can go to um, and make sure that you all have a consistent approach around what you're communicating um, and how best to link your people into support. There's a wealth of places that you can link your children and young people into, whether that's through school or in the community. Um, and we'll provide you a list of those kind of resources as well that you can tap into. Um, but if you get stuck, 
There are social workers in your hospitals. There's psychologists often in your hospitals. You can come to the Leukemia Foundation. I'm sure they would know where to kind of guide you to support if you need it as well. And I just kind of want to leave you. There are some resources here and the Leukemia Foundation are going to provide you with many more resources, including books that you can go to as well. Um, but my hope is as we come to the end of this journey, that you feel like your backpack is filled with more tools and resources that you have at hand. And you feel like now you have a bit more of a sense of how you might navigate that terrain that you're facing. Because even in the wilderness, you can find those moments of beauty. And those moments of beauty come from when you're real and you're connected and you're engaged with your children and young people. Thank you much, very much for your very comprehensive presentation, Christina. That was amazing. Um, I'm hoping that our audience feels that as well. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the supporters of the Leukemia Foundation, because without them, we'd not be able to deliver these education events um, like this. Our guest speaker, of course, Christina has done an amazing job generously sharing her knowledge and expertise and time with us today. Um, also, would like to thank all of you living with blood cancer. We encourage you to use this information to start conversations with your healthcare team, families, friends, and guide your family towards better communication. If you have any questions or concerns, we encourage you to call us on 1800 620 420 to speak to someone in person. Our team of blood cancer support coordinators are here to help. They can provide emotional support and refer you to services within or outside of the Leukemia Foundation.